They work with perfect precision, stalking their prey, waiting for the right moment to strike. The payoffs are huge, millions of dollars for a few minutes of violent work. They leave no evidence behind, but to get away, they're willing to leave bodies. The FBI and local police must stalk this dangerous gang of thieves and break up their bad company. Boston FBI agents and local police tracked a gang of robbers who specialized in armored car takedowns. Their MO was familiar. The gang used precise timing to steal millions in cash and burn their getaway cars to destroy evidence. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the robberies grew more violent, agents launched a complex sting to trap a deadly ring of thieves and shut down their dangerous operation. December 22nd, 1987. Outside Boston, Massachusetts, just before 8 a.m. A time when most professionals are heading to work. But today, a group of professional criminals are also on their way to a job. Their target is Weymouth, 18 miles south of Boston. They arrive at a bank at 8.30 a.m. and sit tight. Here they, come. they aren't waiting for the bank to open. All right, guys, lock and load. The heist is on. away behind a nearby shopping center. get away with over a million dollars. It's one of the largest armored car heists in Massachusetts history. Weymouth police get the call about the robbery and notify the FBI. Police officers and agents respond within minutes. FBI Special Agent Jim Crawford is among the first to arrive at the scene. I was in that immediate area for unrelated reasons, conducting an investigation. Um, I heard on my radio that there had been a robbery of an armored truck in Weymouth upon arriving at the scene, which was just uh, probably a few minutes uh, after the robbery. I proceeded into the parking lot area. I observed several money bags that were left outside on the ground uh, that the robbers did not take with them. That was the most surprising 
a fact that I observed immediately. While investigators are working the scene, they receive a report of a burning blue van fitting the description of the getaway vehicle. The van is less than a quarter mile from the bank. There was a vehicle there that had been burning for probably at least 10 minutes, and pretty much it was burned out completely. There was no determination uh, of any vehicle identification number. There was nothing of any evidentiary value uh, found in that vehicle. At the bank, forensic investigators comb through the front parking lot where the robbery began. They search for anything the robbers might have left behind, but find nothing. Police also process the armored car for clues. Again, they find nothing. The armored car crew tells agents they didn't get a good look at the robbers' faces because they wore masks. All of them had masks, but I think they were white because I could see one of the eye holes. The robbers also wore gloves. Forensic techs don't lift a single usable print. What troubles agents most about the heist are the robbers' tactics. It was very unusual. Gunmen unloaded the vehicle, and they had a countdown. One person would serve as the count. You used a stopwatch. They knew exactly how much time they were going to spend perpetrating the robbery. The professional that they, they handled the truck, um, the getaway um, area where they had burned out the vehicle, uh, prof uh, very professionally uh, accomplished. The job is so professional, agents have almost nothing to go on. The only clue investigators have is puzzling. I believe they left in the ground over a million dollars. These robbers, whoever they are, are pros. Leaving that much money to stick to a timetable suggests they've done this before. This was the most disciplined, the most training, the most uh, cautious group that I've been involved in with, uh, with 30 years in the FBI. The agents know this is going to be a tough case to crack. This gang is good, and they probably are not working alone. Usually on this type of professional robbery, it's always looked at the possibility of an inside person. Uh, there was nothing to indicate here uh, that was the case. Uh, I know the guides had been interviewed uh, during the course of the investigation, but nothing to indicate that they were involved in this robbery. The precision of the Weymouth heist reminds Agent Crawford of the string of jobs pulled over 25 years ago by a legendary Boston criminal named Richie Harold. During the uh, later part of 1977, I was the case agent on a robbery, the Wells Fargo armored truck that occurred in Braintree, Massachusetts. As a result of that investigation, I developed sources that indicated uh, the primary suspect in that robbery was an individual by the name of Richie Harold. In the 1960s and 1970s, Richie Harold and his gang were suspected in multiple armored car robberies, which were considered to be perfect crimes. Although no fingerprints are found in Weymouth, Agent Crawford feels Richie Harold had something to do with this. The similarity between the uh, Weymouth armored truck robbery and the Wells Fargo and Rankbury were that uh, they were restricted on time on the Wells Fargo robbery, just as the Weymouth one. Uh, they were highly professional in their commending of the vehicle, the armored truck. Um, they left uh, no witnesses behind, nothing of evidentiary value. But Richie Harold couldn't have pulled off the Weymouth job. He's dead. The Boston area has always been a haven for armored car robbers. Agents know what to do. They hit the streets and start working the usual suspects. In the 60s and the 70s, Charlestown was kind of infamous to 
have a lot of young men that were involved in bank robberies and armored truck robberies. Hijackings of trucks, for example, were very prevalent in the 70s there, and then more professionals got involved uh, with the uh, perpetration of armored truck robberies during the 70s, the 80s. To broaden their reach, the FBI forms a task force with the Massachusetts State Police and Boston Police Department. They cast a wide net, questioning every informant they have. You're really depending on confidential sources to lead you at least the right direction, uh, people that are involved in this type of activity. But the informants don't give the investigators anything. The investigation stalls. And agents know, with a gang this good, it is only a matter of time until they strike again. On December 22, 1987, robbers hold up an armored car at a Weymouth, Massachusetts bank and get away with over a million dollars. Special Agent Jim Crawford. They were not uh, foolish at all to go uh, buying large purchases or talking to anyone, and uh, they pretty much operate in secret uh, and uh, well, dealt, well disciplined to stay away from anybody that might uh, uh, inform on them. Despite the task force's best efforts, the trail of the Weymouth robbers goes cold. The task force disbands after a year of hard work. Even so, investigators fear they haven't seen the last of the robbers. I believe that these individuals would strike again. Number one, they were successful. The amounts of money they obtained was very significant. There was no indication to them that they were being closely monitored by the police or the FBI. And it was a matter of time that they were involved in another robbery. Agents worry they will lose more than money if the robbers strike again. The individuals that take the task on robbing an armored truck, uh, first of all, go with the idea that they're going to escape and perpetrate this robbery no matter what they have to do. That would include uh, killing police officers. May 31st, 1989, a year and a half after the Weymouth robbery. At a bank in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, about 60 miles east of Boston. Agents' concerns about violence tragically come true. The robbers take control of the armored car in seconds. Once again, the robbers force the driver to take the armored car around to the back of a shopping center near the bank. It is the exact same M.O. as the last robbery, only this time they leave very little money behind. Robbing an armored car is more lucrative than a bank heist, according to FBI Special Agent Jim Crawford. The average bank robbery today between uh, cameras and a bulletproof glass and bait money, uh, it's risky for not a whole lot of money, not substantial sums. Uh, if someone wants to spend the time and training on perpetrating an armored truck, the rewards are far greater. They use a smoke grenade to obscure their escape. As the wounded armored car guard fights for his life, police try to find the men responsible. Deborah, Deborah. You saw three men come out of here? Yeah, I saw three of them. Officers like Massachusetts State Police Staff Sergeant Richard Rand try to get descriptions of the robbers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Some saw the robbery in progress, but uh, as far as identifying the uh, individuals or giving uh, you know, significant information about their identity, they were masked. and. Uh, there was very little information that was provided that uh, could lead to identifying the suspects. 
suspect. Police see the robbers torched a getaway vehicle. They know the suspects had to find another way to flee. The most likely escape route into the woods. But there's a deep stream that would be difficult to cross. Further into the woods, investigators find a makeshift bridge over the water. They'd gone to the time of preparing their exit so that they could get across the stream and probably not, not get all that wet so that they would obviously uh, stand out to other people or law enforcement if they were approached in, in the uh, short time after the robbery. Officers follow the path and come out in a residential neighborhood. Across the street, a potential witness. Police learn the man saw something suspicious just a few minutes earlier. Hello, sir. He watched three men walk out of the woods carrying large sacks. Then a car drove up. He didn't get a good look at the men carrying the bags, but he saw the driver. Police issue an APB for the car with four men inside and radio the driver's description. Police dispatch helicopters to search for the vehicle. Forty minutes after the robbery, investigators find the robber's car a few miles from the bank. The robbers torched it to destroy the evidence. But unlike the Weymouth robbery, this time some items inside didn't burn, including a blanket, a bank bag which held money, and an unexploded die marker designed to go off when thieves opened the money bags. Because the die marker didn't explode, the robbers must be experienced enough to open the money bags without setting them off. This time, the fire didn't destroy the vehicle identification number. Well, the VIN plates uh, typically survive these fires, and uh, you know they're visible through the windshield. Uh, and you know, first thing that, that was done by uh, arriving law enforcement was to run the VIN numbers. Police learned the car was stolen months earlier in Weymouth, Massachusetts. The FBI finally has evidence that could put them on the robber's trail. May 31st, 1989. The FBI and local police investigate a violent armored car robbery. The robbers get away with over $800,000. The robbers shot an armored car guard in the back. They left him to die in the bank's parking lot. Paramedics rushed the guard to the hospital. Miraculously, he survived. A few miles away from the bank, investigators found a burned getaway car. They recovered the VIN number and determined it had been reported stolen in Weymouth, Massachusetts, months earlier. Police found another torch vehicle in the rear of the bank. They believe the robbers also burned it as a diversion. The police and the FBI get a break. They find a flare inside that was designed to start the fire. It didn't burn completely. This car was also reported stolen, but its ignition was intact. At this scene, the evidence helps the FBI. But the wounded guard signals that these robbers are becoming more dangerous. Even with the evidence left behind, Massachusetts State Police Staff Sergeant Richard Rand fears these robbers will be tough to catch. They had a good plan in place to execute the robbery. They had a good plan in place to, to make their escape. And, and they had a good plan in place to destroy whatever evidence uh, 
could possibly be left at the scene for law enforcement to gather against them. So uh, uh, they had done their homework uh, and they knew, uh, they knew the armored car schedule, they, they knew the bank schedule, they knew you know, ex everything that they needed to know about uh, how to execute their, their, their plan. And uh, it, it was a very well executed plan. Agents interview witnesses and learn the robbers used duct tape to seal the gap between their sleeves and gloves, as well as their pants and boots. These robbers were very sophisticated in, in that they, they made sure that they didn't shed any evidence at, at these scenes. Investigators find no useful evidence inside the armored car, no bullet casings at the scene. The Fitchburg job is so similar to the robbery in Weymouth 18 months earlier that it catches the attention of FBI Special Agent Jim Crawford. The similarities between the uh, Fitchburg and the Weymouth robbery were that, uh, number one, they were both professionally done. Uh, both robberies uh, were timed. They knew exactly how much time they were going to spend in the area of the victim truck. Uh, they used an incendiary device, uh, both on the getaway vehicles. These people know exactly what they wanted to do, and, and they knew how to do it. But the FBI and local police still know very little about this gang, other than the fact that they are experienced and dangerous. It will take every weapon in the FBI's arsenal to bring them down. Investigators follow up on their best clue left by the Fitchburg robbers, the burned car. They learned the car had been reported stolen from South Boston six months earlier. But the vehicle's ignition showed no signs of tampering. Police suspect the robbers may have had a key. I interviewed the owner. He had stated that he had, in fact, reported the car stolen, but that he had lent the car to a friend, and uh, that friend had come back to him and said that the car was stolen. He'd parked it somewhere and uh, it had been stolen. <laughs> The friend who borrowed the car is named Greg yeah. Hicks. FBI, speak to him a second, please. Investigators have reason to yeah. suspect Hicks himself in. in the theft. We came up with the fact that he had a criminal record for a number of petty crimes and uh, auto theft. Yeah. And it seemed like he had a substance abuse problem. Greg, we'll show you. Investigators okay. pressure Hicks to come clean about what happened to the car. It wasn't particularly difficult. After some conversation about uh, you know, the severity of the crime, that uh, you know, he'd been using an armored car robbery, somebody uh, been shot, uh, you know, these are serious crimes, and that uh, you know, because he was the last person to have the car, and uh, you know, he, he, he could be implicated. He had uh, admitted that the car was not, in fact, stolen, that he'd uh, borrowed the car, and that uh, he'd given the car to a person and then he'd gone back to the owner of the car and told him that the car was stolen so that the owner would report it stolen. Greg Hicks also admits to stealing the sedan used in the Fitchburg robbery. He says he gave both vehicles to a man named Carl Tucker the night before the gang struck the armored car in Fitchburg. Investigators hit the streets again, asking their sources about Carl Tucker. Nobody knows anything. They turned to veteran Boston police detective Martin Coleman. He was a sleeper. We knew nothing about him. He was doing aluminum siding and uh, replacement windows out of a storefront on Broadway in South Boston. He owned the building. But his hobby was uh, robbing armored cars and getting information about armored cars. Investigators do not have enough evidence to confront Tucker. There are no eyewitnesses to the crime, and he has made no incriminating statements. All they have is Greg Hicks' claim that he gave stolen vehicles to Tucker. Agents tail him, trying to learn more. We had confidential sources indicate that uh, the persons responsible for these robberies were hanging out at a uh, lounge in South Boston.
Investigators try to learn the identities of Tucker's associates. At the same bar, they see a known bank robber named Fred Rogan. Rogan has a connection to a robber Crawford knows all too well. He was an individual that came to my attention back in the 70s. Uh, he was suspect in the robbery in Braintree, associated with Richie Harold. I had done surveillances in the 70s and seen Richie Harold meet with him. On one occasion, I believed I observed them surveilling a bank in the area of Quincy, Massachusetts. If Fred Rogan was involved in the two armored car robberies, it would explain how the robbers could pull off such an elaborate job. Almost two years after the Weymouth heist and two months after the Fitchburg robbery, agents finally have suspects. The question is whether agents can bring down this dangerous gang before it is too late. Two armored car heists 16 months apart net a gang of robbers over $1.8 million. On the first job, on December 22, 1987, the gang left no evidence behind and took over a million dollars. It is one of the largest heists in New England history. The second heist didn't net as large a take, but the robbers made an uncharacteristic mistake. They failed to completely torch a getaway car. A VIN number on the vehicle led them to a man named Carl Tucker. Hey, Tucker hangs out at bars frequented by Fred Rogan, the protege of a dangerous but now dead armored car robber named Richie Harold. While agents know quite a bit about Fred Rogan, they know very little about Carl Tucker. Investigators hit Boston streets to ask contacts in the city's criminal underworld for background on Tucker and any associates he might have. Boston Police Department Detective Martin Coleman is part of the FBI task force investigating the robberies. We had a pretty good idea who was capable of doing these armored car robberies. And uh, it was as the saying goes, round up the usual suspects, and that's exactly who we started to look at. One of the usual suspects is convicted thief Steve Farrell, who just got out of prison weeks earlier. He couldn't have been part of these robberies, but he might know the men who were. He had committed armored car robberies himself as an employee of one of the armored car companies. He drove off with the truck one day. It isn't long before Farrell gives investigators a big break. I said, do you have any ideas of who the uh, armored car crew is out doing these armored cars? Farrell automatically states that Carl Tucker is probably involved. And I was shocked that I hadn't even mentioned the fact to him that he had ordered the stolen cars. I set up a meeting with him and Special Agent Crawford in a Chinese restaurant in the middle of Chinatown. We operated, I should say, with the source on a very confidential basis. There were only two people that knew that basically he existed during the course of this investigation. That was myself for months and months and Detective Coleman, because we were concerned not only for his safety, but any possible, because these people uh, had contacts with different police authorities. Steve Farrell explains he knows Carl Tucker fairly well as an acquaintance in Boston's criminal underworld, but they have never worked together on a job. He says Tucker is known on the streets as the king and that he uses a legitimate business to launder dirty money from robberies. Farrell's help is a huge break for the investigation. His information is solid, 
and he wants to help shut this gang down. He volunteers to work as an FBI informant to gather more information on Carl Tucker. Farrell explains he's in failing health because of a heart condition and wants to make up for his criminal past before it's too late. The source wanted to show his children that he had moral fiber. He wasn't just a criminal. And to prove it, this was his way of proving that he could do something. He wanted to prove that he wasn't the, the person that his kids thought he was. Investigators are concerned for Farrell's safety and caution him that he'll have to enter a witness relocation program once the investigation is complete. Farrell is still willing to put his life on the line. It isn't long before Farrell establishes contact with Carl Tucker. Hey, man, what you doing? All right, all right, doing all right. They were both aware of each other's backgrounds. Uh, they both uh, streetwise um, trusted each other. But trust in Boston's criminal underworld only goes so far. Tucker is slow to talk. He always played it cool, never, never told him he was in the armored car business, never mentioned any other members of the gang. And this went on for quite a while. Farrell hints that he needs work, hoping Carl Tucker will bring him into the gang. But Tucker is too cautious to take the bait. We were getting nowhere. And uh, finally, we said to the source, why don't you tell him that you have a, a relative that's in the armored car driving as a driver? Tucker is intrigued. He asks Farrell if he could use his contacts at the armored car company to obtain what is known as a trip ticket. A trip ticket would provide valuable secret information to a professional armored car robber. You're not giving him the key to the armored car, but you're giving him the uh, location where the armored car would be at what hour and what kind of money it would have. The trip ticket was so valuable to the robbers, again, because any professional that believes he has inside information, it's like having inside information on a race or a lottery. Farrell offers to do his best to get the trip tickets. The FBI agents on the case win approval from the U.S. Attorney's Office to furnish Farrell with trip tickets to give to Carl Tucker. It was kind of one of those things you had to really think long and hard and willing to be very dedicated. Once you gave this, it was your responsibility to make sure that that armored car started its route and finished its route without being robbed at some other location. The tickets are for an armored car's Tuesday routes. The handoff goes down. The FBI has set the trap. Now all they can do is watch and see if Tucker takes the bait. In order to solve a series of violent armored car robberies, the FBI hands a known criminal specific information for an armored car's Tuesday route. It is a big risk but one they have to take if their informant Steve Farrell is ever to win the trust of the FBI's prime suspect, Carl Tucker. The plan works. With the gift of the trip tickets, Farrell gains Tucker's confidence. Everything good? Everything's great, thank you. FBI technicians install a listening device in Steve Farrell's car to capture the increasingly open conversations Carl Tucker is having with the undercover source. I'd have to say on this source that he was a natural, always got direction from the FBI, uh, things that you would want to say basically not to entrap, 
that type of instruction, the legal instruction, but uh, uh, he knew this trade as well as at any seasoned uh, FBI agent. We only take a certain amount of money and a certain amount of time. Carl Tucker begins to open up about his criminal enterprise with Farrell. But he is always vague about the exact details of future jobs. Surveillance efforts slowly reveal the identities of Tucker's associates, men the FBI know all about. Men like James Murphy. Jimmy Murphy always claimed he wrote the book on Ahmed Kaz. He uh, always liked to brag that he was the best Ahmed Kaz robber in the country. Another associate is Michael Habich. Well, Michael Habich was a uh, career criminal. He'd been in prison most of his life. He always carrying a gun, a violent criminal, also an army car Investigators know Fred Rogan is an old pro. He had a history of bank robbery and army car robberies. He was one of the usual suspects and lived within two or 300 yards of the Weymouth Ahmed car robbery. We don't get greedy. Right. Farrell Jesus takes it all in. Homework. And right. so does the FBI. Yeah, things are good. Low key. Low key. Agents obtained the trip tickets from an armored car company that agreed to assist in the investigation. An armored car crew volunteers to help the task force. Agents warn the guards that a gang of armored car robbers will have trip tickets for their Tuesday routes. The agents assure the guards that they will not be alone. We'd place an FBI agent in the armor truck, the potential victim truck, who was there basically to safeguard the guards, to be there in case something went wrong, to be there in the event that uh, something happened earlier than we anticipated. A team of investigators and agents will also tail the armored car. Over the next few months, agents observe the suspects shadowing the armored car. They looked at the truck every Tuesday, and they timed it, what time it arrived and what time it left. And they knew exactly, you know, same guides all the time. It was very interesting to watch them and not get caught ourselves. Agents can never be sure whether any given Tuesday will be a dry run or the day the robbers strike. It adds up to a lot of long hours. Every Tuesday for months, we started at four in the morning and didn't get through until the Ahmed car left. And then we followed the Ahmed car for the rest of its route to make sure that they weren't still following and gonna take them down in another location. June, 1990, in Methuen, Massachusetts, FBI agents and an assault team watch what starts out as another dry run. Then, the suspects start to make their move. Go, go, go! June 1990, in Methuen, Massachusetts. An FBI task force watches a gang of dangerous armored car robbers. The gang spends months shadowing an armored car. An FBI task force believes the men got away with two robberies, one in 1987 and one in 1989, that netted them almost $2 million. Agents can never be sure if the suspects are rehearsing an upcoming robbery or if it's the real thing. At the bank in Methuen, the gang makes its move. One of the vehicles they were driving made an overt move towards the armored truck. Go, go, go! 
Based on that, one of the surveillance vehicles followed just for safety purposes. But the FBI task force and Special Agent Jim Crawford discover it's just another dress rehearsal. Being safe comes with a price. Stand down, stand down. Their prime suspect, Carl Tucker, could discover he's being watched. The FBI has an informant, an ex-con named Steve Farrell, who has earned Carl Tucker's confidence. Through listening devices installed in Farrell's car, agents learn that Tucker was spooked by the Methuen experience. He indicated that he believed that this could possibly be a setup. And my source was reprimanded, uh, did you tell anybody about the activities of this location? Uh, based on that uh, discussion, I saw us backed off and said, uh, uh, who's to say somebody else didn't Anybody mention something? Yeah. Farrell tells Tucker that they can't work together if they don't trust each other. Tucker calms down and later tells Farrell that he and his crew will shift the robbery target to a bank in Abington, Massachusetts. Trip tickets the robbers are working with give precise times when the armored car arrives and leaves Abington, and the amount of cash on board. When they targeted the Abington, it was believed they approximately had $2 million in that truck on a given run. Over the next several months, the FBI task force watches Tucker and his men stalk the armored car as it delivers money to Abington. The long hours every Tuesday takes a toll on investigators and resources. There was lots of pressure to get this done because if every Tuesday, half the office in Boston was out on this case. The surveillance team, the SWAT team, the, uh, the airplane, everyone was working. Agents are concerned about the expense and fatigue caused by shadowing the robbers. So they instruct their source to tell Carl Tucker that the Abington Bank is closing its branch and that on January 9th, the armored car will remove a vast amount of cash. We held that carrot out. It was a solid gold carrot. The bank was closing. It's time to do it. Go ahead. It was, uh, it was Which one? It's going to go down tomorrow. Today, Agents run. learn that Carl Tucker is planning a dry run on January 9th, 1991. This could be the dry run that turns into a robbery. Agents surveil members of Tucker's gang in the early hours of January 9th. They notice pre-dawn activity that suggests the gang is up to more than a dry run. They were seen carrying what were believed to be bags containing weapons, the way they were being handled. We strongly believed then that they were going to possibly make a move and, and attempt to perpetrate this robbery. The suspects arrive hours before the armored car is scheduled to show up. They stake out the location. They don't know they are not alone. The FBI task force is there. Agents quickly identify multiple vehicles containing suspects, including a van. The FBI assault team is prepared for a robbery attempt when the armored car right, arrives. Get out. We're going to take them down quick. There was high risk involved, uh, basically, on apprehending these people. We believed they would be armed based on prior history. But by 10.30 AM, the armored car still has not shown up. It's running behind schedule, unusual in the armored car business. Both the robbers and law enforcement are on edge. Then, the robbers discover the surveillance effort and attempt to flee. Agents decide to take them down. Go, 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 go. The 
The task force converges on all the suspects' cars at once. The agents know they are inside, but they don't know if the men are armed. They proceed with caution. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Get your hands up. Carl Tucker is taken into custody, along with two men from Ireland named Michael McNaught and Stephen Fitzpatrick. The old pro Fred Rogan had been standing guard outside a van. He tries to walk away by acting like a bank customer. But the ruse doesn't work. Inside the robbers' vehicles, investigators find several items that prove Abington was definitely not a dry run. Ski masks, police scanners, smoke grenades. The van had enough items to start a small war. The armored car finally arrives nearly a half hour behind schedule. Agents asked the driver why the armored car was so late. We got stopped for speeding by the state police, he said. And then, he, well, what did you say to the trooper? We told him we were on our way to get robbed. They, they were, FBI was waiting for us. The trooper didn't believe them and gave them the ticket. In the end, all of the participants in the attempted armored car robbery in Abington were convicted. Michael Habich was sentenced to 19 years. The oldest of the group, Fred Rogan, got 10 and a half years. As did the Irishmen, Michael McNaught and Stephen Fitzpatrick. Carl Tucker received 19 years. James Murphy was the only suspect tied to the Fitchburg robbery. A witness saw him behind the wheel of the getaway car. Murphy fought his charges and received a 65-year sentence. They were all criminals to the core. They li lived a life of crime, and uh, they were all repeat offenders, and they never got out of the business, and I assume that they're out of it now because there had been no more on the car robberies. The FBI's chief source, Steve Farrell, provided damning testimony that helped convict the robbers. I was with the prosecutors during the trial. The source's life was threatened by one of the suspects, then threatened his life in my presence. Because of the threats against him, Steve Farrell went into the witness protection program. He died a few years later, knowing he had at least in part made up for his criminal past. I would say with the source involved in this case, uh, redeem himself, I, I, I would agree, uh, he risked his life. FBI investigators were never able to charge anyone with the Weymouth robbery. But if the Abington robbers perpetrated the job, it was a crime that came with a steep price. Each of them will spend at least a decade in prison. <laughs> <laughs>